Welcome to today's Global Connections television program. I'm Bill Miller. The main purpose of this show is to promote a discussion of major international issues such as war and peace, economic and social development, climate change, and human rights that impact people worldwide. New knowledge will inspire, involve, and motivate all of us to better deal with these challenges and to help create a better world. Today's program will focus on the European Union at the United Nations and what the European Union and the UN are doing to combat climate change, to promote human rights, and to deal with many, many other issues. We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're focusing the spotlight on the European Union at the United Nations. My guest today is an expert on the EU and on these issues we're going to be talking about. My guest today is Mr. Ambassador, His Excellency Joao Valdemeda. The Ambassador is a Portuguese national. He is currently the EU Ambassador to the United Nations. Ambassador Valdemeda previously served as the first EU Ambassador to the USA from 2010 to 2014. Your Excellency, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you. Great to be here. I appreciate you being with me. We're going to get into these topics and these important issues in just a minute, but let's flash back to really back to 1945. We saw the end of World War II. Sixty million people had died. The United Nations rose out of the ashes of World War II, really. Yeah. Come right down to it. June 26, 1945 in San Francisco. Talk a little about Europe in the condition it was in at that time, and then how it developed the EU in the early 50s and, and the motivation for doing that. Well, it seems a long way back, but in fact, it's very important to understand where we come from. And we come from civil war in Europe. Mm -hmm. Two world wars were basically at the heart, at the beginning, European civil wars. Too many people died. And uh, our grandfathers, our founding fathers, they realized in the late 40s, early 50s, that we need to stop that. And we need to build a new Europe. And with the help of the United States, very strong transatlantic alliance, the Marshall Plan and, and, and so on, building of NATO as well, we created the conditions for what was then the community, the European community. Six countries, founding countries, now 28. So we've gone a long way, but the reason, the rationale behind it, remains the same. Create the conditions for integration in Europe, unify Europe, mm -hmm. and prevent war from happening again. Mm -hmm. And of course, large parts of Europe have been destroyed during World War II, and that is not, fortunately, not the case today. Let's talk about today. You mentioned you have 28 member states that are part of the European Union. You're one of the largest economic blocks, the largest economic yeah. block in the world, and the largest population block, are you not? Yeah, we have half a billion people more than half a billion people in 28 <coughs> countries. So we move from six to 28. We have a continental dimension from Lisbon to the, the Russian uh, border. And, uh, and we bring together countries that were democracies for a long time, but also countries that came mm -hmm. from long periods of dictatorship or authoritarian regimes. I lived myself 17 years in a dictatorship, under a dictatorship in Portugal, which is my home, mm -hmm. my home country. The, the people from Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe were behind the Iron Curtain for many years. They are all together now uh, under the same values, freedom, democracy, peace, solidarity, uh, but also uh, an internal market, a single market where uh, people, capitals, uh, goods can circulate uh, freely. This is what the European Union is about. Two thirds of the countries have a single a common currency, the euro. Uh, you know, it's the biggest trade bloc in the world the biggest provider of development aid. So we are very proud of what we have achieved. And there's a tremendous amount of diversity in those 28 countries, language-wise, customs-wise, yeah. and across the 23 board. 23 official languages. 23. <laughs> I don't speak all of them. <laughs> but oh, not all of them. Not at all. Uh, <laughs> but it reflects the diversity. Our motto, by the way, is united in diversity. And I think this uh, sort of encapsulates 
uh, the strength of the European Union. Mm -hmm. we, we respect the diversity of each member state, but at the same time, we do a lot, a lot together, including mm -hmm. on foreign policy and security issues. Mm -hmm. And with this diversity of 28 countries, you're dealing with diverse issues at the United Nations. You're a major player at the UN. You're a powerful economic bloc, political bloc. How do you, do you have weekly meetings with the 28 countries, the ambassadors, bring them together well, to I have talk the, about I issues? Have, I have the privilege of working with 28 great ambassadors. Mm -hmm of uh, all the 28 European Union member states. And every uh, Tuesday morning we meet in my office, I chair and host the meeting of all the ambassadors to exchange views, exchange information, but also coordinate our positions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you'll be surprised to know that uh, in a given year, all these 28 countries vote the same way 93, 94% of the time. Mm -hmm. So on 90, more than 90% of the issues that uh, uh, the UN is called upon to vote, the membership of the UN is called upon to vote, the 28 vote the same way. This mm -hmm. uh, reflects, uh, you know, of course, a, a great commonality of values, mm -hmm. obviously, but also of interests of the Union. But behind that, there is a lot of work of coordination that my team, who is an excellent mm -hmm. group of uh, diplomats, they uh, and myself, we contribute every day. Exactly. And out of that diversity comes homogeneity on these issues. So that's very true. Now, as I mentioned, you're a very active player at the United Nations. The 70th session of the General Assembly is underway right now. You have three themes that you're focusing upon as European Union. And under those three broad rubrics, you have many, yeah. many uh, diverse areas. Let's talk about the first one, a safer world. What, uh, what are you focusing on and working with UN agencies and other groups, too, to help create a safer world to deal with interstate conflicts, intrastate conflicts to a large degree? What uh, yeah. are some of the main issues in that particular area? I, I think you agree with me that today's world is, uh, is relatively complex, mm -hmm. relatively volatile, and difficult to manage. And I think we are confronted with new threats. Uh, we will use, during the Cold War years, to a relatively predictable world. A dangerous one, but a predictable one. I think today's world is less predictable may be equally dangerous. Uh, and it, they, it, it requires solid cooperation. Uh, you know, first of all, among ourselves, the 28, but between the 28 and our biggest partners, like the United mm -hmm. States. But even beyond that, we need, within the United Nations, the big family of the United Nations, to create the mechanisms of cooperation to deal with these new threats, the crises that appear around the world. Uh, but also, you know, something like terrorism, global terrorism. How do you deal with that? Who's behind the terrorism? It's no longer a war between states. There are known state actors. Uh, uh, sometimes we don't know who we are fighting, mm -hmm. but we know to, we have to fight that, that battle, and we have to do it together, otherwise we'll not succeed. So this is the kind of environment, the context in which we have to, uh, to operate. So our basic point is to say, if we are united, the 28 of the European Union, we are in a better position to engage with our partners mm -hmm. inside the Security Council, in the General Assembly of the UN, in the larger uh, international uh, community. Mm -hmm. And a major element of some of these interstate and intrastate conflicts has been this tremendous flow, literally tens of thousands of migrants coming out of Northern Africa, coming out of the Middle East, to and most of them coming to Europe, to Italy, yeah. to Greece, and some of the other countries. What's being done in this area to provide assistance to the folks, but also maybe to try to deal with the problems back in Syria or wherever yeah. the source of the problem may be? I, I think we have to start by understanding the, the magnitude of the problem mm -hmm. and how intense and difficult it is for the European Union. Uh, we are surrounded by what somebody has called a ring of fire. You, you start in Ukraine, you go through, uh, through Syria, uh, Middle East, uh, Libya. Uh, this is all Europe's backyard. You know, so Libya is a few hundred miles away from the European coast. Uh, Syria is next door. So all these hotspots, crises, difficult situations, human tragedy as well, mm -hmm. has a direct impact in Europe. The US is much further away. Asia is even further away from that. But, you know, and of course Europe is, is a very attractive place. You know, uh, anyone in distress uh, thinks, and, and rightly so, that Europe is the right place to go because we are attentive uh, to those the values of solidarity and we have a good quality of life in Europe. So it's only normal that people in distress try to get to Europe. The question is how to deal with that. And this is the debate in Europe uh, today. 
my, my, my point to you, are, to you and our listeners and, uh, and our audience is to remind them that this is not a European problem only. Mm -hmm. This is a global problem. Uh, and a problem that requires global solutions. If you want to stop uh, the conflict in Syria, which is one of the root causes of this flow of uh, migration and refugees and asylum seekers to, to Europe, you need the international community to be active. You need the United States, you need Russia, you need the, the United Nations uh, to mm -hmm. operate that. If you, uh, your concern is Libya, and Libya is our concern today because it could be a uh, 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 haven for uh, terrorists a few hundred miles from European coast, we have to have international cooperation. We have the UN very active there. And, uh, and we are making good steps in that direction, but a lot remains to be done. So the migration issue in Europe is certainly a European problem, but not only a European problem, it requires global solutions as well. And these issues we're talking about today are on your website. We're going to flash it up on the screen in the lower thirds right now so our viewers can go to that or they can just Google European Union at the United yeah. Nations and find you. One and they can also fa follow me on Twitter. Uh, exactly. Valerie Almeida <laughs> EU and uh, I'll be glad to interact with everybody interested in following what we do. Another way to communicate. One mechanism that's in place to deal with a lot of the intra, mostly intrastate conflict is with the United Nations peacekeeping missions. Peacekeeping was not mentioned in the UN Charter in 1945, but it's a major part. It's about 20%, not quite 20% of the UN budget. There are 16 yeah. peacekeeping missions, in some in very dangerous areas of the world. What's been the role of many of the European countries as far as participating in the peacekeeping mission with personnel or financially or perhaps providing technical assistance to the yeah. UN peacekeepers? <coughs> major, major, major contribution, great supporters of UN peacekeeping efforts. I give you a figure on financing. We, we finance one third of the financial effort necessary uh, for the p UN peacekeeping efforts. Mm -hmm. one in the mm -hmm. 10 first countries, the most important contributors to the financial effort behind uh, peacekeeping, in 10, five are from the European Union. So this gives you a sense of how uh, much we invest, how much we uh, find it is important for the UN to have a strong action on peacekeeping. We are largely uh, uh, the greatest supporter of peacekeeping effort in the, in the, in the United Nations. You're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately financed, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections Television are solely those of the moderator and his guests. Our viewers are invited to check out the website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous shows. If you're interested in distributing our shows through PBS, Community Access Television, educational institutions, a website, or any other media outlets, please go to our website. For more information, Global Connections Television is provided as a public service at no cost. Today we're looking at the U European Union at the United Nations. And my guest today is an expert on the European Union and the United Nations. My guest today is the His Excellency Ambassador Joao Valdemeda, who is the current European Union Ambassador to the United Nations. Mr. Ambassador, we're talking about these problems. We're talking about peacekeeping in particular. There are so many other problems that we're facing also. If you look at, let's say, a lot of the scientists say that right now the number one problem we're dealing with is climate change. Yeah. Every report I've ever seen, article I've read, no country has reported thus far, to my knowledge, that climate change is a good thing and that they're benefiting from it. It seems like every country has been really adversely affected. What has been the overall approach of the European Union and the individual countries to this issue of climate change? Well, we believe this is the major the most important problem facing mankind today and the planet as a whole. And uh, I don't think there's any doubt anymore about the scientific basis of this assertion. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to fight uh, global warming, we need to fight climate change, and we need to do it now. And we have been on the forefront of this battle uh, for many years now. I remember going back to my previous jobs in Brussels, the s capital of the European Union, in the, in the mid-2000, uh, in 2006, 2007, we were the first global entity to approve a package that autonomously dealt with climate change. Mm -hmm. You know, fighting it uh, in all sorts of ways to try to reduce the increase of global temperature. We were pioneers at the beginning. There weren't that many people, many countries following us. Today, we have a global deal. In Paris in December, uh, yeah, the entire international community agreed on what needs to be done 
to counter uh, climate change. We're very happy for that. I think it was a great victory for, for the United Nations, for the Secretary General, who fought very hard for it, uh, and for all the countries that got involved. And we now need to implement that. Uh, so we are very proud of our track record, but we are also uh, very much aware of the responsibility that we have, sharing with all the others, to make it happen. The Paris conference, as I understand it, was probably the most concrete of the UN conferences that brought the countries of the world together to deal with this climate change issue. There was some provision in there for a five-year review. So uh, even though these targets, these goals yeah. of two degrees Celsius, 3.6 Fahrenheit, they're voluntary, but there's still a review mechanism, is there not? Absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, first of all, it was very difficult to <laughs> get to where we were in Paris, right? Mm -hmm. We had a you know, uh, a, a whole uh, parcours of uh, difficult yeah. negotiations we had in Copenhagen, we, we didn't make it. So mm -hmm. there was a, lef a lot of effort behind it. We need to keep the momentum of that. And uh, in April, we'll have the, the signing, the official signing of, of, the, of the agreement, which will be another moment for people to realize how important it is now to, to implement, to deliver mm -hmm. on our commitments. It's not enough to sign a paper say I'm going to do this or that. That's why the reviews are important. That's why the national accountability is important. So every country needs to control what they do because we, we have one planet. I mean, there's no point in Europe doing an effort if other countries don't do because I it's the same planet. So I it requires a common effort. So reviews, uh, periodic reviews, but also monitoring everything we do is absolutely necessary to keep uh, the momentum. We owe, it to, we owe it to the next generation. I may be incorrect, but I think, was it Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said there is no planet B. This is it. <laughs> the blue marble we're on now is the one we have to no preserve. No B, no C, you only no have planet A. <laughs> exactly. And we have to take care of this, otherwise uh, it will uh, be in serious uh, danger. The future will be very bleak. It certainly will. When we look at the, the situation with climate change and what's going on, we, it ties right into the Sustainable Development Goals. Yes. And of course, these were 17 logical goals agreed upon by 28 members of the European Union and the other members and of the more, yeah. UN General <laughs> Assembly to focus on eliminating poverty and hunger, to empower women and to promote gender equality, to conserve the oceans, those types of things. Yeah. How important are those to the members of the European Union, and what are you doing? We can't talk about all 17, but are there some that rise to the surface that you're focusing on and, and moving the member states forward and trying to move, really, the whole United Nations forward on them? I, I think this is one of the greatest achievements of the United Nations ever. Mm -hmm. And I invite our uh, viewers to look at the 17. I mean, it's, it's a magnificent compilation of uh, 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 mm -hmm. I, it's, it's a global to-do list, uh, which brings together everything that you can imagine as being right, as being necessary, as being urgent. Uh, we believe we should implement all of them. We should not make uh, any hierarchy of this is more important than the other. They all come together. They all interact. You cannot achieve one without at least trying to achieve another. So we are very much uh, in favor of a comprehensive approach to all these, uh, uh, to all these goals. Uh, but again, I, I invite the viewers to take a look at it. Uh, it it's quite a construction of, of a global agenda for, for the next 15 years and beyond. And it was something that really, as you mentioned, took so long. Of course, it was built on the Millennium Development Goals, yeah. the first 15 years of the Millennium Development Goals, and now the Sustainable Development Goals, but they are, they are a tremendous accomplishment. And so many organizations out there, governments are focusing on them, but just about every non-governmental organization in the world, be it a faith-based group, a Rotary Club, a Lions Club, Optimist International, they are working on one or more of those Sustainable Development Goals. A and we need and their that. Members. We need that. I mean, this That's is right. not a, a job only for uh, governments. Far from that. You have to have uh, civil society, NGOs, citizens individually, the business community, extremely important for the success of the SDGs, and the United Nations as a, as a system. Mm -hmm. But there is, and the difference between, maybe one of the difference between the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals, is that this is not only about uh, the developing world uh, doing what needs to be done or us to achieve our objectives in the developing world. It has to do with everybody, including us, the European Union member states, the United States, Canada and beyond, the developing world, the developed world, if they want. It, everybody needs to play a role. 
because again the concept behind is the planet A and no mm -hmm. planet B. We need to contribute for uh, uh, to these goals together, and each of us, each country, has a particular responsibility. Everybody has a role to play, and we have to resolve these problems together. There's no way you can do it individually. Now, your third theme for the 70th General Assembly session is effective multilateralism. That's the biggest foreign policy term I'll use the whole day. What, <laughs> what do you focus on under effective multilateralism? Well, it's an awful expression. Let's <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's agree on that. But behind <laughs> it, behind that, it lies you know, the, the whole philosophy of the United Nations. Mm -hmm is that uh, for a single planet, which is the only one we know and the one we live in, you need to find, uh, uh, you need to converge into uh, solutions. So you need multilateral. That is, not only one country can solve a problem, you need more. W we approach this in a, in a sort of regional level with the European Union. It's the basic concept. We cannot achieve it alone. We better get our act together and act uh, collectively. So you, you transpose that to the global level, you have the same kind of, of, of rationale. So mu effective multilateralism is bringing people together, discuss, negotiate, sometimes long hours, reach consensus, and implement what you have agreed upon. This is effective multilateralism. It's a, it's a beautiful concept, not easy to, to, to implement, uh, but this is what brings so many people around these uh, buildings of the United Nations. And uh, last year was a very successful one. We mentioned SDGs, we mentioned mm -hmm. the climate deal. I could mention also what we agreed on financing for development, on disaster uh, uh, risk reduction. Uh, a number of areas, it was a, a, a very successful year. This year is about implementing all that. The most challenging thing I think at the UN right now, it, it has been really for several years, talking about this multilateral cooperation and effectiveness, the UN is focused upon reform. I remember when Kofi Annan came in as Secretary General back in the mid-90s, I guess it was, and he came in with a two-track approach to improving the internal and external effectiveness of the United Nations. How important is that for the European Union members? And again, remember that the UN is the only organization of this type in the world, 193 governments. There is no other United Nations, no Absolutely. other group that brings that, or entity that brings those countries together like that. But how, do you focus on that? Is the EU working with the UN to improve in the efficiency and effectiveness of the United Nations? Be very much so. We are great supporters of the United Nations. We want it to, even, ev to be even more effective, more efficient, to deliver even at higher levels of uh, of, of performance, so our member states are very much uh, involved in that, and uh, and uh, we every time you have a change of secretary general, mm -hmm. there is a, a, you know another discussion about what should be done, and we are entering a new cycle, as you know, in the, in the UN as well. So we would like the next cycle to be even more ambitious in terms of uh, reforming the UN, making it a more effective uh, player around the world, concentrate on on the sustainable mm -hmm. development goals, and put all the all the tools at the service of this uh, beautiful agenda. That's, that's, our, that's what we do on a daily basis, and all member states of the European Union are fully committed to that. I think you and I are in agreement that climate change is probably our number one problem that we're dealing with, the number one challenge. But as you look over the horizon, look into the crystal ball, and look at some of these other problems, I know we've talked about migration, we've talked about a variety of other issues, poverty, hunger across the board. What do you see as far as the major challenge we're going to face as people, 7.3 billion people on the planet over and above pl uh, climate change as we move further into the 21st century? I think we have a number of challenges apart from climate change. Mm -hmm. We have the issue of natural resources, uh, among which I would put uh, very high up in the list uh, water. We have issues of food security. How are we going to feed all these all these people in 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 good in good uh, conditions we may have issues of migration mass migrations that could be triggered by either armed conflicts or even by climate change if we don't do enough in, in good time to 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 prevent that so there are a number of issues but uh, i would say that uh, we need to look attentively at the issue of terrorism now mm -hmm. on the short term uh, you know, non-state actors involved in acts of violence, violent, uh, violent extremism rising mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you want in a more political level, uh, the rise of what we call in Europe populism, uh, mm -hmm. from the left and from the right, challenging 
even challenging multilateralism and globalization and all that. So there is a debate out there about the way we organize the world. And I think uh, uh, all of us, and certainly the European Union member states and the European Union as such, we are very much committed to making sure that we preserve our values, mm -hmm. human rights, fundamental rights, democracy, individual freedom, uh, free trade, uh, but also uh, uh, support for development of the developing world. Uh, we, we are the biggest provider of development aid and humanitarian aid. We, we want um, continents like Africa to develop much faster than up to now. We want to create all the conditions for, you know, peace and security around the world. Well, Ambassador Zhao Valdemeda, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank I you. want to thank you for bringing us up to date on the European Union. And thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you, Bill. Thank it was you. great to, have to my, be here. My thank pleasure. You. I hope you've enjoyed today's program. Please join us again for the next episode of Global Connections Television. I'm Bill Miller. Thanks for watching.